Uh, good morning, uh, Colonel Tony Schaefer. Thank you so much for coming on today's show. Stephen, always great to be back. Thanks for having me again. Yeah. Okay. I have so many questions, some of them about the United States, our border situation, our military, the government spending our tax dollars inappropriately. Yeah. Uh, others, I want to talk about what's going on in the Russia-Ukraine war. So uh, let, let's jump in. But thank you sure. so much for taking time out of your schedule to be here. Sure. Okay, so um, th this is kind of a big story that I'm not seeing get a lot of coverage. Um, yesterday, British intelligence released satellite imagery uh, that Putin has stationed 18 nuke bombers 140 miles from the Finland border. Mm -hmm. However, intelligence is suggesting that these bombers are not there to intimidate Finland, but rather to have closer proximity in case they need to be dispatched to the United Kingdom. Is, is this a uh, intimidation tactic or is Putin uh, readying the Russian army to go after the United Kingdom for sending in these uh, missiles uh, that, that can attack Russia directly? So I, I think it is. No, I think I disagree with the analysis. I think this is meant to intimidate the fin, the Finns, the Finnish. Uh, remember, in 1939, uh, the Russians invaded Finland and it was a very bitter fight. The Russians initially did not. I mean, they were I think the loss rate was 26 to one. The Finnish were just kicking uh, the Russians. butt, and now Finland's moving into NATO as well. So, yes, of course, they, they've put these things Russia has put these things uh, up on the border to remind people there would be consequences for behavior Russia doesn't like eventually. That's it's 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 a deterrent measure. Uh, Stephen, I, I re recommend people really go back and look at the Cold War and learn more about deterrence. Deterrence was all about very public, very clear displays of military force. Uh, back in the early fifties, uh, Eisenhower, once he became president, used the B thirty six Peacemaker as a propaganda tool to, to dissuade the Russians from doing certain things regarding their nuclear program. This is very public. It was part of something called the New Look by the Eisenhower administration, where they believed, uh, wrongfully, I might add, but they believed at the time that they could use essentially the, the, the idea of nuclear force as a, as a factor to prevent any need to engage conventionally. It didn't work. As well. Obviously, we didn't we know it didn't work, but it didn't stop them. But the idea of deterrence is what's behind Putin's thinking. It's behind the deployment of these nuclear capable bombers. And the Russians indeed are trying to remind people that they are still a nuclear power, that they would, uh, if push comes to shove, use nuclear weapons in response to th some threat threat and i'm using air quotes here because it's it's whatever they the russians perceive as that threat do they the russians perceive the british support and the u.s support for ukraine as a quote-unquote threat yes they do but that threat is not sufficiently uh metastasized to the level of them the russians feeling they have to respond directly uh, against nato and the west so that's where we're at and i think but i think the deployment of those nuclear capable bombers is a reminder that if you all continue to poke the bear if i could coin a term uh you, you, something might something bad may happen and i again i do not putin will not lose the ukrainian war he, he will he will go to nukes before he will do that and i'm just saying that that this is a reminder of that fact okay wow that's scary okay um you know i wondered if it had more to do with finland and you know just barely joining it's all NATO. related because it's if they make right. a strike on the United Kingdom, all hell is going to break loose. Um, but if they can intimidate and remind uh, Finland, hey, we're right here on your border with some serious nuclear power. Uh, OK, thank you. I appreciate the, the insight on that. Um, <clears throat> the United States is very excited about their Patriot missile system arriving in Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, we're hearing stories of it. Uh, I, I saw a video clip of it you know, launching 30, 30 uh, counter-strike missiles and, and effectively defending Ukraine. However, they're saying it took down a hypersonic missile, which has gotten some scientists into trouble. We'll talk about that in a minute. But yeah. um, is that system going to be helpful for them? And then secondly, 
uh, we're hearing that Russia has at least damaged one or maybe taken out one. Can you tell us what's going on with the Patriot missile system in Ukraine? Well, let's get some background on the hypersonics first so people better understand. Uh, I, my source is Ambassador Hank Cooper. Uh, Hank Cooper ran SDI under President uh, Bush 4041. And uh, he's one of our distinguished fellows uh, for both Project Sentinel and London Center. And he was one of the scientists who worked on this issue. He actually run, run, runs a company or a former company uh, that makes nuclear weapons and deployment systems. So he explained to me what goes on with hypersonics. Hypersonics are indeed a very effective weapon system, but there are certain points in the flight, in the trajectory that are vulnerable. For example, when it's coming out of certain, when it's coming out of hypersonic status, it's basically got to slow down, Stephen, to the point where it's it's not hypersonic. It's fast, but not hypersonic. It's got to slow down because it, to be effective in targeting, it's got to kind of see where it's going. So it's kind of it's going fast, and it slows down, and gets ready to go down, and, and as it's coming out of, of it's, it's slowing down to go its final trajectory, it's vulnerable. So I think. I think we figured that out. Just saying, I'm not. I, I'm not giving away secrets here. I'm speaking based on my conversations with a scientist, with, with someone who was des- worked in these designs back in the '70s. So, but my theory is, the Patriot uh, algorithm figured out that vulnerability and was able to figure out that very small window of when it's coming in, and you can see it, and you can get it. That's what I think happened here. So, as much as They've said, and I've said publicly, oh, we can't shoot them down. I was corrected by Ambassador Cooper saying, well, there's a window of vulnerability, and that's what they were looking at. Again, just for the audience to know, I'm not speaking based on any direct knowledge of what uh, the U.S. defense establishment's done. So just so we're clear on that. But I think that's what, what happened here. Regarding the Patriots itself, it's good news, bad news thing, Stephen. I mean, yeah, they shot all those down. They they may have shot one of the two of these things down, but at what cost? Patriot missiles are hugely expensive, and they're burning through like thirty a a a, a day. That that's not sustainable. Uh, these things are hugely expensive. We can only manufacture so many uh, so fast. So I think the public disclosures of the Teixeira documents uh, that were leaked, I think, are accurate. I think. Uh, by the end of this month, and we're talking uh, two weeks, the, the Ukrainians are going to be out of effective countermeasures to take out the Russian uh, missiles coming in to include Patriot missiles, because you can only manufacture and use so many so so long. So, uh, you know, it's it's um, it's a game of attrition at this point, Stephen, of, of who 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 overwhelms who first at this point. So, yeah, I, if you had to guess, are you talking these missiles are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars or in the millions of dollars? Oh, hundreds of thousands. Well, oh. I'd have to go back and look at the actual costs, okay. but the, each Patriot missile is high tech. It's super expensive. And we're talking probably uh, 50,000 a pop. I mean, I'm sorry, 500,000 a pop per missile. So if you're, if you're shooting off 30 of those darn things, that, that's uh, a lot of money very, very yeah. fast. That is a lot. And, that is a and lot. you can't and you can't sustain it. It's not sustainable. I mean, yeah. remember, we've had to use these things to to protect the Israelis during uh, Gulf One, Gulf Two, and uh, we've deployed them in Korea to defend uh, South Korea and Japan against North Korean missiles. Uh, they're effective to a certain level, but again, uh, there uh, certain um, certain theories of the adversaries, especially the Chinese, regarding uh, U.S. Navy ships and countermeasures i was again watching this yesterday regarding i was studying the chinese problem gordon chang and i speak on this often basically the chinese theory is they're going to be able to have so many tactical m- missiles coming in that that each ship can can only uh, use countermeasures for so long before they're overwhelmed i think that's what the russians are doing here at a larger level it's just basically pounding away knowing that the patriots are expensive if they take out a couple of launchers that's a degradation of capability it's just again, it's a numbers game, and I just don't see the Ukrainians winning. Yeah. Okay. No, that's uh, that's that's very interesting. Um, you know, part of the damage that came to the Patriot missile system, from what I read, was an intelligence officers were watching for where those missiles were defending, and yeah. then they they just dialed in where they wanted to hit, and that's where they they attacked. So they basically, it's almost like they provoked them. 
yes. to fire, like like in World War II or World War One. The numbers you can game. See where the shot comes. Now you know where where to attack. So yeah. Um, okay. Hey, basically, if if it if if you see if it sh if it shoots, it's observable. If it's observable, it's killable. Okay. That's it. That, that's, I mean, it's 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 really that basic, Stephen. This is the, things have not changed since basic art, you know, tube artillery. Well, since we started using radar to trace back, uh, and, you know, we developed systems which basically are big old uh, trailers with radars on them. And the moment you see see, see something coming in, you can tr trace back the trajectory of where it came from. This is just a larger level of that. And this has been technology around since at least the 60s in some form. So, OK, well, and I have to imagine uh, Putin or maybe his Russian generals, um, you know, there's been so much hype in the media about these patriot systems the first thing they would want to do would be to take them out yeah of course uh, same thing with the abram tanks they said as soon as those tanks arrive we're giving bonuses to whoever takes those takes of those tanks out and they're for the challenger absolutely yeah. again Stephen, this is not to, to, to quote it for this is not rocket science this is uh basic warfare 101 and it's kind of like I've said, the more we we telegraph what we're sending, the more likelihood it'll it'll fail instantly by the fact it's going to be taken off the battlefield if you make it obvious. Uh, I've I've been around a day or two. I've done this a day or two. And during during the 80s, we were very careful about protecting information about what weapon system was going where and when. Uh, nobody actually knew what exactly we were deploying, where it was going. Uh, I was involved in a number of counterintelligence uh, capers to try to deceive people, the Russians, about what was going on before the Cold War it came to an end. And then after the Cold War came to an end, we, we didn't want to actually acknowledge things we were doing. And so uh, we've seemed to lost the bubble on that and have no interest in actually protecting the security of our forces or those things we're giving to our allies. Yeah, it's like <laughs> Russia can just like open up the wall street journal or Pretty the much. new york times oh they're going to put it in this city and we'll just watch for it and, and well you think we'll... too remember there's 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 choke points one of the things that we've it's like i can't believe they're not talking about this trying to fix it if you send things into ukraine via poland it's only going to have a handful of places it can go into poland from poland into ukraine <laughs> so i've said i'm kind of surprised that they're not sitting there at belarus just over the, you know, looking over into where those those passages are and just kick it, killing the stuff is the moment it comes into Ukraine. Yeah. I'd do that. Yeah. Well, they they may in the future. OK, so um, this this is a very Soviet thing. Uh, when I read it, uh, Putin has allegedly arrested three of the top scientists and engineers that created yeah. the hypersonic missile. He's now accusing them of either lying to him about their hypersonic capabilities or purposely slowing them down in a betrayal to Russia is arresting these men. Is this an intimidation tactic to get them to squeal and tell the truth? Or do they actually believe they've betrayed their homeland? So um, as I often say, you can take the man out of the Soviet. You can't take the Soviet out of the man. And that's what's going on here. The, the, the Russians, as a culture, have a history of putting people in jail and intimidating them. I, I, aside for you, the night, you know, 1910 on during uh, the run up to the First World War, the czars putting people in prison, and then uh, the, you know, Lenin and the Soviets and, and the gulags. Stephen, this is part of their culture. This is just, you know, boys will be boys and Soviets will be Soviets. And that's what they're doing here. So Putin is, is displeased. He's a thug. Uh, you know, again, let me restate for the audience. I am not pro-Russian. I'm not pro-Putin. Uh, I never have been. We I spent a lot of time trying to defeat the, these knuckleheads during the Cold War. With that said, there's no doubt that, uh, yeah, he's displeased with the scientists and he's going to harass them. He's going to run them over the coals and he's going to remind them that they're part of a, a very much of a totalitarian system, no matter what happens when they vote. And these guys probably did the best they could. Did they exaggerate? Yeah, scientists are scientists. These guys are probably trying to sell a weapon system to make money. Uh, you know, if you're part of that defense establishment, you're always trying to make money. That's part of the part of the job. And did they oversell the weapon system? Probably. 
Uh, is that illegal? Eh, maybe in their system. I don't know. Uh, they do it here all the time. They oversell stuff and people eventually go to jail if they oversell things. Uh, Elizabeth Holmes of uh, of, um, of uh, Theranos fame is off to prison finally in the 30s of this month. So, you know, sometimes people are held accountable here as well. But uh, I think it's just uh, a matter of Putin being uh, sh kind of showing his true Soviet colors at this point. Okay. Um, let, let's let's come back to the United States because uh, I've seen this in the comments section a lot. I've talked about this with other people. Um, I love our military men and women, but Congress uh, has been approving hundreds of billions of dollars, yeah. 800 billion dollars of taxpayer money to go to the military. Uh, our military spends as much as the next 10 countries combined, including right. China. Right. So where, where does this money go? And why is so little of it used to defend our own borders? Excellent question. Let me, let me break that down. I belong to something called the Pentagon, uh, Pentagon budget campaign. It's a nonpartisan tripartisan everybody who basically has an issue in this the progressives to conservatives were all together in this i actually did a note to someone this morning on something and um my my mantra here is i want an effective defense not an expensive defense and i would argue we have become completely muscle bound and and a prisoner to the to the budgetary process which has uh, been developed over the past uh 50 years Eisenhower warned us of this. I'm a big fan of Eisenhower. Eisenhower and Reagan, two of, my, two of the folks I, I try to emulate. Eisenhower said we must be aware of the military, industrial, congressional complex. And that's what's going on here. You're seeing uh, all those entities enriching themselves off the back of the American people and and the, the, the defense for American people. I do believe, and my, Bruce, my friend Bruce Fine, uh, congressional, uh, a, a constitutional lawyer always talks about the fact that we must be prepared to defend the Republic, not ex work in ways to be antagonistic to, to those and not, not essentially use our military forces as the first option in a response to an international crisis. That, yes, that's what, that's what we do. So that, to do that then, uh, Stephen, what we've done is we've maintained forward bases globally everywhere. And I, I just don't know if that's wise. I mean, I've been one of those saying we need to restrict uh, where we put things physically, the moment we show up somewhere physically, we're the target. So I do question the need for so many forward bases at this point. And those things are very expensive. You got to, you know, spend a lot of money to move people, family, maintain facilities, huge expenses. And those things always expand. So that's one area I would instantly look at kind of reducing the costs of. Secondly, uh, we have uh, 28 to 1. Uh, regarding uh, the number of general officers that to 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 uh, people in the field, we have literally made uh, staff headquarters the priority globally. So during World War II, we would have uh, uh, I don't I, I wish I would have I, I'm sorry I I don't have the exact numbers on me, but I can get them for next time. Uh, we would have something like I think. Uh, a uh, hundred and and eighty people per general officer, or something like no, no, it's higher than that. It was like thousands, like a thousand people per general officer. Now we've got like one hundred and twenty eight. Anyway, the number is wackadoodle. Where we've invested hugely in large, bloated, expensive staffs. Remember, uh, people cost a lot of money. Uh, I, I'm a retiree, and I get a lot of money because I'm a retiree, and I signed up and I put my time in, and and I'm due a certain amount of money back. Uh, what we now see, uh, Stephen, is, is for those who are uh, in senior positions, they're treated like uh, King Farouk in Egypt. I mean, they, they get huge, huge benefits. Uh, some of these generals are, are very expensive and uh, they're expensive to maintain because, you know, each staff has dozens of people who basically respond to that general. There's no need for it. Uh, I, we've we've seen a uh, proliferation of 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 um, bureaucracy, not effectiveness. So that's another area that needs to be cut back. And then anything that is established as a quote unquote line item, basically when you go into the defense budget, Stephen, there's line items. Anything that is established as a line item, it's there forever. I mean, you could be, and I'm sure if we look deep enough, you would find uh, World War II era uh, contracts relating to making mess kits. And we don't use mess kits anymore, but I'm sure you could go back and find a contract somewhere still in the system that makes mess kits. Here we are a uh, hundred years down the road from when it was something was needed. 
we don't have a, a ready method of going through and, and removing things which are no longer needed. And therefore, if it's still in there, if it's a line item, it gets funded every year and it gets added 7% per, per year. So it just it just keeps going. And nobody's willing to actually do the hard things of going in and looking at, at what needs to be pulled out. Uh, research and development, another huge area of waste. Uh, you know, I was reviewing something the other day where, where John F. Kennedy finally killed, I think it was in 1964, a program where they had proposed to put nuclear um, nuclear reactors on airplanes and, and keep them flying. And it's like it was a technology dead end, yet we spent back then in, in those dollars $1.6 billion on something that was a technology dead end. So, I mean, we we have an immense amount of money being spent uh, constantly now and not uh, not effectively. For example, we we're trying right now to re uh, re-engineer some of the nuclear reactors in ships that we need. We we all agree that aircraft carriers are a necessary tool, yet the Navy can't afford because of budgetary mismanagement and other mistakes they made to, to put nuclear reactors back in the aircraft carriers. But yeah, we've got this bloated budget. So the priorities are, are simply not adequate to the circumstance we find ourselves in. And again, nobody wants to have a realistic conversation about this because, you know, everything gets protected. Nobody, no, even two members of Congress too, they don't want anything in their district to be jeopardized by people coming and looking to, to, to do cuts. So it's it's the worst of all worlds. And that's why you see this $800 billion monstrosity, which will do little, if anything, to actually facilitate keeping America safe based on our requirements. Okay. Colonel McGregor has said to me that more and more the United States is avoiding diplomacy and more and more members of Congress are hiding behind our military men and women. What what do you think he means by that? Again, I think that often uh, the executive branch uh, with the full concurrence, tacit concurrence of Congress will, will use military force as the first response to a diplomatic issue. Uh, fight might might makes right and i think uh, uh we have uh, often turned to using military force over trying to be more persuasive using diplomacy and, and let me explain that a little bit more because I, I think maybe i might have mentioned this and i, I appreciate I, I apologize for being redundant tony zinni uh, a friend and mentor of mine i worked with back uh, about uh, 12 10 years ago on a number of issues explained to me how during the time he was commander of Central Command, the sink of Central Command, he would get called in by President Clinton uh, regarding a challenge. And uh, he basically would be called to Washington to explain, hey, General Zinni, can you do X? And it was a military option. Obviously, if you're the commander of Central Command, you're going to be using military force. So um, I and often Zinni would push back and not want to do it. So he would be fly, he'd fly up to Washington. Bill Cohen was Secretary of Defense, Bill, a Republican, by the way. Bill Cohen would say, come up, meet with Clinton. And he said out of the, the six disputes he had with Clinton, he won four of the six. That's good good odds, I guess. But he would go in and, and Clinton would say, hey, General Zinni, can you, can you do X? Can you invade X? Can you do Y? Whatever, you know, something military. And Zinni would look at him and say, yeah, I can do that. And then what? What are you going to do after that? What's the solution past military? And I think because we have such a huge overbearing military, often politicians, to include both executive branch and uh, congressional legislative branch, yeah, just use military force. And I think that's something that's not healthy. We saw it uh, executed in Libya. Libya is a prime example of where this did not go well. Syria, another area where I think we're over militarizing something that needs to be resolved using diplomacy and special operations forces. And I think all too often we uh, will use th that as an option long before it should be used as an option.